Okay, folks, uh, welcome. Uh, we are meeting online today uh, because of uh, the online security issues that have been going on at uh, Guilford Tech. Uh, but hopefully we can still uh, make a good discussion uh, of uh, this really interesting paper uh, by Travis Timmerman. Uh, so here's uh, the plan for this quick video today. Uh, we're going to review uh, Peter Singer's argument, which tells us that we have a moral obligation uh, to give to famine relief charities. Um, and within that context, we'll also consider uh, some objections to Singer. And once we've done that, uh, we will then examine and think about uh, the objections uh, that come out of today's reading by Travis Timmerman uh, about uh, Singer's argument. So let's dive right in. Here is Singer's basic argument from last time. He says that one, suffering and death from a lack of food, uh, also things like shelter, water, uh, basic medical care, is a bad thing. Two, Singer says, if it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought, from a moral perspective, to do it. Uh, he then points out that when you donate to an aid agency, you can prevent suffering and death from a lack of food, shelter, and medical care without making any sacrifices that are nearly as important as uh, you know, preventing suffering and death from lack of food. So therefore, you, if you do not donate to aid agencies, you're doing something uh, morally wrong. Uh, now, for many of you, this might have made you had a pretty strong reaction, right? Uh, you know, we might try to put these sorts of feelings into memes or something like that. We might think that, you know, Singer's argument is just the kind of argument that's going to freak us out a bit, uh, as in this meme, or we might think that, uh, you know, every time you uh, spend some money on yourself on some sort of trivial pleasure, like, you know, buying some pizza instead of having a cheap meal of, let's say, rice and beans at home, uh, you know, it feels like that's like a, an evil impulse speaking to you. Uh, and, you know, that's sort of a natural reaction that we might end up having uh, to Singer's argument. But we might also notice that uh, for the first, uh, premise one seems pretty plausible, and premise three is one that we can have some pretty good empirical evidence for. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you do your research, you can find that there are a lot of charities uh, that do really important work. So one example of a really great charity is something like the Against Malaria Foundation. Uh, they basically provide bed nets uh, to children in villages in Africa uh, in order to uh, prevent these kids from getting malaria. Now, about a million people a year die from malaria, uh, and it's very cheap uh, to provide these children uh, with bed nets. Just a net you can put over the bed. I think every time you donate $10, uh, you can basically get another child uh, in one of these countries a bed net, right? And we would think that, like, the $10 that you can spend on a bed net is better spent on that bed net uh, than anything you would have spent it on if you spent it on yourself. Uh, so, you know, in my case, uh, I, uh, you know, the trivial things that I spend money on are things like food uh, that's, you know, pleasant but that I don't need or coffee. I'm also uh, big into music and musical equipment, so I buy vinyl records or guitar equipment. Uh, Peter Singer would point out, I could spend that money better, right? And that's why we end up starting to have uh, these reactions, as in the memes. So when you have these reactions, that's like a natural thing. Um, and I think that we should realize that uh, if we want to reject Singer's conclusion that every time 
you don't donate to an aid agency, you're doing something morally wrong. What we have to do, because this is a valid argument, we have to show that at least one of the premises is false. Uh, because uh, when you have a valid argument, if one, two, and three are true, it's impossible for four to be false. So if you want to show me that four is false, uh, you're going to have to show me that at least one, two, or three is false. Uh, because we've got a valid argument here. So let's think about some objections that might arise against Singer's argument. So here's one. Some people might say, look, uh, global poverty is too big of a problem for any one person to solve on their own. Uh, you know, people will always be starving. People will always be dying of malaria, unfortunately. Uh, but this is because the contribution that you might make might just feel too small. So you might think that this is a job for the government. But Singer replies, it's true that we should lobby governments to give more aid. So you should call up your local representative and tell them how important it is to you that people on the other side of the world, that their suffering matters and that we should do more to prevent it. Uh, but Singer points out, like, just because the government is not doing their part, uh, that doesn't mean that you get off the hook when it comes to doing your own part. Uh, and Singer also points out, as a matter of consequences, he says, if we give nothing uh, in terms of our own charitable donations, that may well disincentivize the government uh, from uh, making aid payments. So in a certain way, by making uh, charitable donations, you can also sort of lead the way for others and for large organizations uh, to come along with you to collectively solve that problem. So the point that governments have a responsibility uh, to deal with global poverty doesn't get you off the hook, at least according to Singer. Here's another objection. It might say something like this, um, and this is sort of a libertarian type objection. And it says, look, uh, when it comes to our moral duties, we only have a duty to not harm other people, but we don't have duties uh, to help. Uh, so we might think that the duties to help others only arise when you cause someone to suffer. Uh, so the idea might be, look, I have an obligation uh, to repair the wrongs that I've caused, but in terms of other people's suffering, I don't owe it to them uh, to fix their problems. But Singer replies, this seems really highly implausible. So if we think back to Singer's case of the drowning child, right? you're just walking through a park and you see a child drowning in a shallow pond. Uh, Singer would say, well, it's quite monstrous. Uh, it's quite implausible to say that, well, if it's not my fault that the child is drowning in the pond, I don't have any duty to help that child. Uh, so Singer thinks that this claim about when we do and don't have duties just isn't plausible. It can't account for uh, our common sense intuition that you ought to save the drowning child. Uh, Another thing that we could say on Singer's behalf uh, in response to this kind of argument, and this uh, is getting into the paper for today, uh, Timmerman points out that it's been noted that there are many ways in which affluent nations do contribute to the suffering and famine of those living in extreme poverty. Uh, and if that's the case, if our way of life is having an effect on these people who live on the other side of the world, then it seems like we would still have a duty uh, to help these people in need. And then we get this last uh, sort of objection. Uh, you know, this might be what we were seeing in those memes, right? Uh, that Singer's argument just kind of freaks us out because Singer's saying every time you spend a dollar on something that you need less than a starving person needs, uh, food, 
uh, you're doing something wrong. But so if you say that like this argument is too demanding, uh, Singer is going to point out that well, hey, the conclusion of this argument follows validly from some very plausible premises. Uh, it does seem like suffering is bad. It does seem like you're doing something wrong uh, when you pursue something trivial instead of something that's very morally important, like alleviating the suffering of others. And it's also very plausible uh, that uh, we can alleviate the suffering of others uh, without giving up uh, much of great importance. Here's another point that Singer makes. He says that whether we think that uh, something is too demanding uh, depends on what is the cultural norm. So he's not saying that, you know, it's relative from one culture to another uh, what is too demanding or not too demanding. But he is saying what we perceive to be too demanding uh, is very influenced by uh, what we see other people doing in our culture. Uh, so the thought here is that we should work to change the cultural norms uh, surrounding demandingness. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Travis Timmerman. Timmerman is another philosopher working nowadays. Uh, and Timmerman is going to uh, offer a critique of Singer's argument. So here's what's happening with Timmerman. Timmerman agrees that you can't just say that the conclusion of Singer's argument is too demanding. You're going to have to uh, show uh, Singer, or you're going to have to show your reader that there's a false premise in Singer's argument. And that's exactly what Timmerman is going to do. So what Timmerman is going to do in this paper that we're looking at today is he's going to deny the truth of premise two of Singer's argument. So just going back. Timmerman is going to deny this claim that if it's in your power to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, you ought morally to do it. Now you might ask, hey Timmerman, uh, how on earth are you going to deny the truth of premise two, given that Singer gives us this drowning child case? Isn't that a clear case where you're morally required to save the child uh, because saving, you know, your nice pair of shoes instead of saving a child's life is a instance where you're doing something wrong uh, because uh, you're required to make a sacrifice of something morally insignificant, your shoes, for something very morally significant, the child's life. So here's how Timmerman is going to come back at that line of reasoning. He's going to say that actually Singer's drowning child case isn't sufficient, or at least it's not necessary. Yeah, I should say that. Uh, the drowning child case is not uh, something that guarantees uh, the truth of premise two. So here's how Timmerman puts it. He says that uh, Singer's case is an ahistorical case. And so he says that it's much less clear to him uh, that you're morally obligated to spend your entire life making repeated $200 sacrifices to constantly prevent children from drowning. So that's like an important first difference that we can see between uh, famine relief and Singer's case of the drowning child. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, Timmerman says that he's going to offer a case that is more analogous uh, to famine relief than the drowning child cases. And Timmerman is going to call his case drowning children. So here's how it goes. He says that unlucky Lisa gets a call from her 24-hour bank 
telling her that hackers have accessed her account and are taking $200 out every five minutes until Lisa shows up in person to put a hold on her account. And due to some legal loophole, the bank is not required to reimburse Lisa for any money she may lose, nor will they. Not a very nice bank. In fact, if her account is overdrawn, the bank will seize as much of her assets as is needed to pay the debt created by the hackers. Uh, yeah, so they're gonna, you know, once her account is overdrawn, the debt will be paid by, like, coming to Lisa's house and taking her TV and her books and whatever other valuable things that Lisa has. Singer goes on. I mean, Timmerman goes on. Fortunately for Lisa, the bank just across the street uh, from her work, the bank is just across the street from her work, and she can get there in fewer than five minutes. She was even about to walk right by it. On her way, Lisa notices a vast space of land covered with hundreds of newly formed shallow ponds, each of which contains a small child who will drown unless someone pulls them to safety. Lisa knows that for each child she rescues, an extra child will live who would have otherwise died. Now, it would take about five minutes to pull each child to safety, and in what can only be the most horrifically surreal day of her life, Lisa has to decide how many children to rescue before entering the bank uh, to put a freeze on her account. And once she gets into the bank, all the children who have not yet been rescued will drown. Uh, so in this case, it's not just about making a single, single $200 sacrifice uh, to save a child's life, but it's making uh, repeated, constant sacrifices to save a child's life. And we might even imagine further that things only get worse for poor Lisa. For the remainder of her life, hackers repeat their actions on a daily basis. So every day, uh, she keeps on getting her money hacked. And every day, the ponds adjacent to Lisa's bank are filled with, you know, an infinite number of drowning children. So Timmerman suggests that this sort of situation is one that is more analogous uh, to the situation we find ourselves in when it comes to relieving uh, the suffering of others uh, in the case of famine. Uh, we could repeatedly uh, give away all of our resources and there would still be more children to save. So, what is Timmerman's case supposed to show? Well, he says that if Singer's premise two were true, then Lisa would only be permitted to go to the bank uh, to maintain and protect things that are nearly as important as a child's life, which might be like Lisa's basic necessities uh, for herself to keep on living. And Timmerman suggests that, well, that's too strong. So here's how he puts it. He says that it's plausible that at least for one day, Lisa should be permitted to enjoy some goods that are less important than a child's life. So the thought would be, maybe one day for the rest of her life, instead of having to sacrifice money and save children, uh, Lisa would be permitted to, for instance, uh, stop and uh, go to the theater and enjoy a play. So the thought here is, if P2 is true, then it's definitely the case that you should save one drowning child from the pond. Uh, but uh, you don't need a principle as strong as P2 to explain the truth of why you should save one drowning child. And if you believe that at least for one day Lisa should be permitted to enjoy some of the goods that are less important than a child's life, then you don't actually agree with premise two because you're saying that it's not always the case that you're doing something morally wrong uh, when you choose a trivial thing over something far more important like saving a child's life. So that's the main case that Timmerman is offering us 
in this paper with its provocative title, but now I think we can see uh, what he's getting at when he says that sometimes there's nothing wrong with letting a child drown. Uh, so here are some objections we might consider towards Timmerman. That's exactly what we want to be doing when we do philosophy. You know, we lay out a view and then we think about how somebody who might disagree with us is going to come back at us. So here's two objections. One objection says, intuitively, Lisa is obligated to save as many children as she can. So some people might say, like, intuitively, she is not allowed uh, to take a day off from saving children and go to the theater. And if that's right, then premise two uh, is still justifiable and plausible. And another uh, line of attack might say that our moral intuitions are not reliable. Uh, so this objection says, well, just because you have uh, sort of like the first initial feeling that it might be okay for Lisa to take a day off from saving children, uh, many philosophers like Peter Singer uh, will say, well, that's just a feeling. Uh, we can't trust our moral intuitions all too much. You know, Singer points out that a lot of our moral intuitions are going to lead us astray, like in the way that we care more about the suffering of somebody who's near to us or in our own city as compared to somebody across the world. Our intuitions are kind of leading us astray in this way. So these might be two lines of response that Singer might make in reply. Here's how Timmerman is going to come back at them. So Timmerman says, you know, if you're a consequentialist, uh, and especially uh, the sort of extreme consequentialist that Peter Singer is, you might accept uh, the idea that P2 still stands, even in light of Timmerman's new case. Uh, but what Timmerman points out is that Singer's drowning child case was originally introduced uh, to show to people whether or not they're extreme consequentialists that they still accept this basic idea that we have an obligation uh, to relieve the suffering of others. Uh, but Timmerman's going to say, but we also seem to have these common sense intuitions that show you're not as committed uh, to always uh, alleviating the suffering of others as uh, Singer's premise two would suggest. What do we say about this other objection that Singer might make, that our moral intuitions are not reliable? Well, Timmerman just says that if Singer is allowed to appeal to the hypothetical drowning child thought experiment, then Timmerman should be able to appeal to the hypothetical drowning children uh, thought experiment, uh, where Lisa is dealing with uh, a repeated uh, series of opportunities to rescue someone. So, uh, that's sort of where we get with the discussion. And it'll be up to you to figure out uh, whether Timmerman or whether Singer uh, gives the more plausible case at the end of the day. Now, let's just wrap up with a final point. Here's what Timmerman concludes with. He says, I'm not exactly sure how much we're obligated to give to aid organizations, but he suggests that it would be the same amount we would be obligated to sacrifice where we to find ourselves in Lisa's situation. So the thought here is, it's not like uh, we can say that Lisa is allowed to ignore all the children, uh, go straight to the bank and save all of her money, uh, but it's also not the case that she has to give uh, infinitely and unendingly. So we might think that you know, Lisa's obligations lie somewhere between uh, complete altruism, you know, looking out for the interests of others as much as she possibly can, and complete 
egoism, where she's looking out only for herself. That what she's obligated to do is probably somewhere in the middle on that. Um, so, you know, we might think about this question of like how much we're really obligated to give to aid organizations. Is it really, like Singer says, until giving uh, would hurt us as much as it would help others? Or is it something less than that? And if it is something less than that, um, exactly how much? Uh, is it till we've done our fair share? Or is it till it begins to hurt us even a little bit? Or is it just when our consciences tell us uh, we've done well enough? I think on this last one, you know, just give until you feel like you've done a good enough job isn't going to be enough uh, for Singer. Uh, because it may be that we can all give enough until we feel we've done well enough, but people might still be starving at that point. So that's going to be something for you to work out for yourself. In any case, uh, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. All right. Take care. Bye.